गुड आफ्टरनून दिस इज अव सम सीरीज दैट वी गुड एंड बाक इन टू ऑन फर्स्ट थीमटी फर्स्ट बिगेन वी आर्स आर सेल्फ वॉट वर्ल डिस्ट्रॉय अ कंट्री Well, we always identify two factors. It's either external factors like wars in Ukraine, and threaten to destroy or undo this country, or it could be internal conflict or corruption. Uh, years ago, when China built the Great Wall of China and think that they will be uh, saving or they will be safe from the northern attack of the Mongolian, but yet again we know it was under attack. It was defeated by Genghis Khan and his grandson. Why? The historian writes about because there are internal conflicts between the Song and the Qing, you know, and also there are some corruptions happening through the gates of the Great Walls and all this. So the internal conflicts or corruption, you know, and we ask ourselves the same question: What will destroy an organization? Well, it could be the same two factors: an external Factors of competitors, you know, or it could be internal organization. Internally, the organization is corrupted, or the conflict between the management level. And sad to say, the same thing actually threatened to destroy the church. External factors and internal factors. Internal factors would be like conflicts or corruption. And this is what's happening at. This church in Ephesus years ago, when Paul was writing to Timothy, you know. So let me give you some background of this church in Ephesus. <clears throat> so verse three in this today's passage, it says, "Paul says, when I left you in Ephesus, when I was going to Macedonia, this happened most likely at Acts chapter twenty, when you see at the third missionaries of Paul, missionary journeys of Paul, Paul himself." So gather the disciples, and one of them you would imagine would be Timothy, and、uh, gather the disciples and encouraging them. Then he said farewell and departed for Macedonia, and they were at left at Ephesus at that time. So this is his third missionary journey. You can imagine at the time you will gather the people, encourage them, then you pull Timothy one side, and some of the elders he says, okay, this guy. This guy is going to be the lead pastor, okay, for the Ephesus、uh, Ephesus Church guy. You listen to him, right? He will be the the, the key te teacher or the pastor of the church. And Timothy will be like, oh man, what am I into? Okay, well, whatever. Okay, but it may not be the case, huh? But he said, I left you for that purpose, you know. And what was the situation at Ephesus Church? At the Ephesus Church, ah,、uh, so Paul went away to Macedonia in Acts twenty. Later, second part of Acts twenty, he came back. Near to Macedonia, he came to this place called、uh, Miletus, and he called for an EDC meeting. Oh, they sorry, the EDC is like the Elder Deacon Court meeting. Okay, well, how do you know? Because he used the word Presbyterian, so he's actually a Presbyterian. I'm just kidding. Okay, anyway, what happened at this meeting? He called for this EDC meeting at chapter twenty and verse seventeen. He says, "Well, guys, gather, gather, all the elders. You see, all the elders now." Yes, now you know why it's Presbyterian, right? No, I just kidding. Okay, so he gathered all the elders, and Timothy must be there. You know, he gathered them, and he gave them a long list of instruction. And one of the instruction is this: at verse twenty-nine and thirty, he says, he warned the elders, including Timothy, probably at the time, of the external threat and internal threat. Look at the verse. He says, "I know that after my departure, fierce wolf will come in." This is external threat of persecution, and not just that. It says from among you, within you, will rise up men speaking twisted things. Draw away, drawing away the disciples after them. Can you see that? So there will be external factors, and also internal threat that actually Causing the church to be in a big situation, and what's the situation? I'm going to run through First、uh, Timothy as an overview for you. What is going to happen at First、uh, Timothy? The situation there, there will be false teachers, false prophets, or false teachers, and false teachings. You can see that in chapter one, verse three. We'll talk about later, and chapter one, verse nineteen and twenty. In fact, he actually named them. He named two guys. You know, we'll talk about that later. 
okay, in the next uh, few weeks to come, then these wrong teachings are not just minor mistakes. So don't think that false teaching is something not important. Paul called this false teaching demonic teachings. And they disagree with the truth. Chapter 6, verse 3, 4. And what were the effects on this church? Well, a few. One, we'll talk about that later in a moment. There'll be more and more speculation. And in fact, some of them actually shipwrecked their faith. Shipwreck their faith. This is the this an effect of a false teaching. Okay, and they will have a, they will cause a lot of false spirituality. Chapter 4, we will come to that in, in weeks to come. And chapter 6 will tell us there will be envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicion, and friction. So, in conclusion, what will false teaching do to the church? I put here chaos in the church at all fronts. Chaos in the church at all fronts. This is what's going to happen. You know, so false teaching is not something for us to take lightly. Can you see how the church becomes so chaotic? There must be some kind of infiltration of false teaching. Okay, so now I'm going to run through what does a whole book of what is the whole book of uh, Timothy look like over here. So chapter 1 is to re-illiterate a serious command to Timothy and says, this is a task given to you. Timothy, remember I told you before I left, this is what I'm telling you. Okay, So he's reiterating that important, that serious command. Chapter 2, he reinstates the gender roles. You know, so don't think that gender confusion only happens in our era. Okay, Right from 2,000 years ago, in first century Christians, this already happened. Okay, chapter 3, reinstall a proper understanding, a proper taking this whole un understanding of leadership in a proper you know, biblical uh, understanding and to have a proper view of what leadership is all about. Okay, reinstall proper leadership. Then chapter 4 is to redefine true spirituality. To re redefine what is true spirituality because false teaching actually will cause somehow wrong idea of what spirituality means. Okay, chapter 5, verse 1 to chapter 6, verse 2, I put here as re-establishing the Christian ethics. Ethics really means it's, it's a set of Christian morals applied to a different scenarios, to different people at a working place, to you know, poor people among them and all this. This is called ethics. You know, so re-establishing what is Christian ethics because false teaching does cause a confusion to Christian ethics and a misunderstanding of Christian ethics. Okay, and lastly, it re-examined the biblical view of possessions to the rich, to the poor, how should we look at money and things like this. So, so I think because you see, false teaching actually caused chaos at all fronts. Can you see all, all this at all fronts? You know, so let's go into this first chapter, the portion that we will be looking at this afternoon. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we pray for energy at this hour as we're going to look at this very important letter from First Timothy. We pray, God, for strength, for wisdom from above. We pray that your spirit will be our teacher, teaching us truth. And not just at the knowledge level, but Help us to bring it down into our hearts as convictions, deep convictions that we truly believe, that we truly practice. We, we need your mercy, we need your help for all this, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we begin at the greetings at chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Now, Paul established his authority or his apostleship here. Because now he's trying to shape out the church, which is have gone disarray, have been dis disorderly, and in fact the church is sick, spiritually sick, you know. And now Paul is writing this letter to help Timothy. This is what he ought to do. So the questions from the audience or recipients would be: What authority do you have? Who give you this authority? You know. So and so I put that verse one to two authority. What do we are questioning Paul? Who gave you this authority? And look at verse 1. Paul state there very clearly. Paul, an apostle 
of Christ Jesus, by God's command, by Christ Jesus. You know, so he's establishing an apostolic authority. Paul is saying that I'm writing these. My authority didn't come from my imagination, guys. He said, my authority comes from God the Father who commanded me and Christ Jesus who commanded me. And I write these by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying that basically he has this apostolic authority, you know, and he's representing God and Christ to command Timothy to exercise and to teach with this authority to the church of Ephesus. So it looks something like this in the, in the diagram. You know, so it's Paul representing Christ and God giving that command to Timothy to teach and to instruct the church. You know, and the church is supposed to learn and to practice these teachings and instructions. Oh, but this is the same pattern today, you know, when the authoritative word of God, the Bible, is to still had the highest authority for our belief and our practice. We want to give to church leaders, preachers, uh, teachers of uh, our church to teach and instruct the word of God to the church. So the church is supposed to learn and practice this. The authority didn't lie with us as pastors or reverend or whatever. Or, no, it doesn't lie with any of us leaders or elders or anything. It li the final authority lies with the word of God. Can you see? Can the final authority lies with the word of God that has the final authority for our beliefs and our practice? And this is a, this is a pattern that Paul is setting up for the people to understand. You know, so one, two implications for us to think about when we come to the book of First Timothy. In fact, we come to the whole Bible. Number one, we must be, be we must be careful not to think that any part of this letter or the whole Bible itself is e irrelevant to us. You know, so, some people think that some portions of First Timothy or maybe some portion of the Bible is culturally irrelevant to today's audience. This is very, very dangerous because the word of God is never irrelevant. You know, man and the glory of man may pass away, the scripture tells us, but the word of God lasts forever. Can you see that? So never think that any part of the scripture, any part of First Timothy is irrelevant to us. Second, there are people who also accuse Paul, especially in First Timothy, maybe, maybe the other part, other part of the Bible, Old Testament as well, thinking that Paul is a male chauvinist pig, MCP, you know, looking down on women, bringing men to high superiority, therefore speaking of some uh, uh, gender is issues and all this. So you, you, they must also be very careful because when you are accusing Paul of such thinking, value system, you are actually despising his apostolic authority, which he represents not himself, is God and Christ. Can you see? We are actually accusing God and Christ and the Holy Spirit who inspired the word to say that the scripture itself is advocating male chauvinism. The scripture is not interested. The word of God is always good and just. Verse 8 tells us, which we are going to go, go to next week, but the verse 8 says the Lord of God is good. It's good. It's fair to any gender, to any, any uh, uh, social structure. You know, so, so we must be careful not to accuse the word of God, the Paul, or the word itself, that it is siding towards male shamanism or feminism. It's neither. You know, how untrue these accusations are, because basically when people accuse the word of God about these things, there's a, there is a fundamental, fundamental accusation of problem, which is whether the word of God has ultimate authority in our faith and practice. Which means that the word of God has authority over not just our church life, but every area of our life. At home, 
at the workplace or school, in your private life, everywhere, everywhere the word of God has a final authority. And when a person thinks that God's word is irrelevant at this area, that area, or is not that fair and good for us in this thinking and that thinking, is ultimately challenging the authority of God's word. This is a very serious thing. You know, he is thinking that this area or this other aspect of it, I want to keep my authority and God's word has no say over it. This is serious. But Paul, coming to his audience with this apostolic authority, is giving Timothy a very serious task. I put there the uphill task, which is the title of this sermon. What did Paul want Timothy to do? Verse 3, he says, I want you to instruct certain men to stop teaching certain type of things. This is an, I put here, an uphill task. You, know, you can imagine this letter is read before the church of Ephesus. And all the people are gathered there. When it's read, this, he says, Timothy, you are supposed to stop certain men from teaching this. So some eyebrow will be raised and whoa, whoa, whoa. Then you're looking around, the leader is over there, the elder is there, man. Hey, man. The, the standard school teacher is there. So they will react, no, you'll be like, these people are all around listening. You know, and who are these certain men? Well, it's up to time because these certain men are Paul even refused. Look at verse 3. Verse 6, he even refused to call them brothers. He just called them certain men or certain person. Paul is probably not even sure whether these are genuine Christians in the first place. He even called him brothers. He, he didn't. He's just certain men. As opposed to what? As opposed to verse 2, you look at he, how he addressed the Mati. My true child, son in the faith. That's how he called Timothy. But that's not how he called this man. Can you see? And this man, you must imagine, if you are in that church, you must imagine these men are probably well-established leaders already. They could be older than Timothy. And they could even be the founding members of the church of Ephesus. You know, so it's, it, it's quite awkward, right, for Timothy to take that job. You know, so, and these men could be very nice people, very popu popular leaders, very glib tongue people who can speak very well, well adored and loved by the people. Or they could, on the other hand, could also be very aggressive to person if you go against them. You know, so now this younger pastor called Timothy was asked to shut them up. Verse 3, asked to shut them up, seriously. You know, so this is an uphill task and I put here, this kind of uphill task, you require the nerve of steel. You require some guts, some courage, some hatred of yourself, but the love of God and God's people. Right? If you love yourself and you want to be popular among these people, you won't want them to do this kind of thing. So some hatred of yourself, but the love of God and love of God's people. So we require this thing called the nerve of steel. And it is, you know, it's always easy to put people up as leaders. But when you ask them to step down, well, that will really be the difficult part, right? This is what he's supposed to do. But we ask ourselves, what is actually wrong with this certain man? What is wrong with them? Is it because they are not in good book with Paul, in the good book of in, in, uh, Paul's good book, or they, they, they stay on Paul and they didn't sing loud enough, or they, 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 they were ugly, or they were they didn't give enough money to they wonder what's wrong with these people, you know. So Paul look at verse 3, he says, These people are teaching different doctrines. That is the key problem. The different doctrines. You know, and these different doctrines are based on what? They are, they, are, they are from this thing called, Paul says, myths. Myths. The myths used in the Bible and the myths in our days are different. Uh. We are not talking about Shun Wukong and uh, talking, the kind of myths. Okay? This myth really means, I put here the definition, that some theories that are not based or some source 
of information that are not based on the scripture, not based on the Bible itself. You know, they, they are here from this. You know, they, they, they think of some creative idea about God, about Jesus, about salvation, about redemption, whatever it is. They, they, they think of some of these, but it's not based on the scripture. And they could be very nice theory, but you can't find it in the scripture. Or you have to twist and turn and do some kind of gymnastic uh, in your uh, in your communities to agree with their with their doctrine this is called myths things that have no basis the source is not from the scripture so what i put there is is versus the self-sufficiency of the scripture because what you need to know about a passage or about scripture the historical context or cultural context you can find in the scripture this is what we believe as a self-sufficiency of the scripture. You don't have to find it outside the scripture. The scripture in itself has all the cultural and historical context that we need to know to interpret and to find meaning to be. You, you, you must truly believe in the self-sufficiency of the scriptures and stop digging into some, some, some ancient Near East writings and all this and use some of this writing to prove your text. You know? Second, it's also from this term called endless genealogies. What is endless genealogies? Genealogies are like, this is a father of who, this is related to this, this is related to that. It's probably understood to be some kind of human authority or tradition. You know, someone said this, my grandfather said this, and this famous, famous person said this, who is linked to this person said this. You know, it could be like just famous people that they are quoting and quoting. Well, I put that this is against the whole ultimate authority of the scripture, whether human has high authority or the scripture itself has high authority. You know, so some, this guy is a, a, a conversation and a ending discussion thing. You know, it's like, how, how do you know this? Oh, Calvin said this. Oh, Calvin said this. So we can't say anymore. Is it true? Who, who said it? Oh, Keller said this. Piper said this. I mean, these are all good people. I'm not saying these are evil people. I'm just saying, but, but when you quote names, you, you, I almost end the whole discussion. You say, oh yeah, these famous people said that. Yeah. So stops all the discussion. No, don't do that. You must say the scriptures said this. Because the ultimate authority lies in the scripture. You can say, oh, Pastor Dinson said this. Or Pastor Cheong said this. Elder Gregory said, no, don't quote us. Quote the scripture. Can you see? We don't have the final authority. The scripture has the final authority. And what is the problem with these people? If the word the word you say is a very interesting word. You say they devote themselves to this, all these things. What I put here that people love new ideas, and the word devote interestingly is used in chapter three, verse eight. Of Timothy and chapter 3, verse 8 of Timothy says, Those who are addicted to wine, this is the word used, devote to these new teachings, devote to myths and endless genealogies. They are addicted to new ideas, actually. They love it, they're addicted to it. You know, they are paying so much attention on it. And why? Well, for two possible reasons within the context of 1 Timothy. One is it has this wow effect. Wow, I find something new, a new doctrine, a new interpretation. People are like, whoa, really? That's great. Nobody had found it before 2,000 years ago. All the, all the church fathers for the past 2,000 have not found any of this except me. I found it. Then people are like, wow. Verse, chapter 6 verse 4 says, these, these people are self conceited they are puff up. This their their version for interpreting for the translation of the word is puff up. They are conceited. It's pride. Because nobody has found it. Say, I have found it. Well, people are like, hmm, that's interesting. You have found it. You know. But chapter 6, verse 5 also tells us the second reason. Because some of them think that godliness is a means to gain. Because good new ideas are very popular. And they sell well. They sell their book. They become invited as speakers and all this. You know, so it is about money making too. So new ideas, new doctrines may not be right 
doctrines in the first place. Because what we have is a good old gospel that Jesus died and rose again and is coming back. This is a good old gospel that we have for our sin, not for our wealth and health. So, some of us may be sitting here and asking, how can I tell these doctrines apart? And how many types of false teachings are there? There are many. But how can we tell them apart? Paul gave us, through the word of God, through Paul, the word of God through Paul tells us this. You know, we can tell them apart by comparing the outcomes. Look at verse 4. He says, these false teachings always give rise to what? More speculation. They promote speculations. What are speculations? Well, controversies, arguments, things that you will never be certain of, things that you can start arguing from now till Jesus is back and you have still no answer to them. You know, so all these kind of speculations. So false teachings always give rise to confusions and speculations. But then you compare this with what? Well, compare this, Paul says, with the stewardship of God. What is the stewardship of God? Well, Stewardship of God is used in other passages in Paul's writing, in Colossians 1.25, Ephesians 2, uh, 3, 2, and 3.9. It says that the stewardship of God is basically the teaching and the proclamation of God's word, the gospel, the word of God itself. It's a teaching and proclamation of God's word. Is it compare these, these people's teaching with the word of God, with the proclamation, the faithful teaching and preaching of the word of God. Compare it. You know, so you don't have to know the thousands types of different uh, false teaching. You just have to com always, whatever new thing come, compare with the faithful teaching and preaching of the word of God. You know, and you will see the faithful teaching and the uh, preaching of the word of God has three effects. Paul says false teaching always give rise to speculation, but the aim of this stewardship of of God, which is the preaching and the teaching of God's word, have a different aim. You have a, you have a different direction, you have a different purpose, and a different goal that you want, which is three in all. No. One is pure heart, love from a pure heart. I put here other people's centeredness. You know, you will cause, you know, when, the, when you have a proper preaching and teaching of God's word, people will begin to understand God's love, and you will change their heart also. You know, and you because you are constantly exposed to the gospel of grace. What is this gospel of grace? That God, in His mercy, spares sinners at us from the wrath to come. And in His grace, He actually sent His own Son to take on the punishment of our sin on our behalf. Why does He want to do that? Because God loved the world. Christ loved us and would give his life for us. It's an other people-centered kind of love. It's a self-sacrificing kind of love. And the more we know the gospel of grace, the more we know the God of grace. And the more we do so, the more we will have this other people-centered love. We will love people, love God's people from a pure heart. Second, Good conscience. I put here, the good conscience really means to live godly lives or morally upright life according to God's law. What is a good conscience? A good conscience is a working conscience. It's an active conscience. A good conscience is actually a very annoying conscience. Annoying because it will keep nagging at you. What is a bad conscience and a lousy conscience? A lousy conscience, we will talk about in chapter 3, is one that is quiet, numb, soothing, sleeping conscience. This is a lousy conscience. It doesn't speak up at all. A good conscience, a working conscience, keep warning you against sin. And so it's very annoying. You know? And a good conscience is informed and activated by the faithful teaching and the preaching of God's word. You know? And by you by doing that, you'll make your active your conscience more active and you'll keep annoying you, warning you that you are going against God and you are sinning against God. So it's very annoying. So if you hear, if you hear the word of God preached and taught to you, and you feel uneasy and it's pricking your heart, you know, 
it could be God through His Word trying to activate your conscience, make it a good conscience, and you feel make you feel lousy about yourself. So don't be angry. Don't be angry at the preacher, the teachers, or the people who counsel you, because they are not targeting you. <coughs> Excuse me. But none of us will prepare a sermon and try to target someone. I will, I will be preparing my sermon and take out my phone and say, oh, look at ah, Matilda's photo. Today's message, I'm going to wag her, you know, Matilda. I'm going to talk about her today. Why? Because Henry and the Catherine not here. Ha 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 ha. Oh, but the boyfriend is here. I better don't talk too much. <laughs> Commando, so much as well. Okay, okay, anyway. Yeah, so none of us prepare a sermon looking at your photo because you are not the center of the universe. Come on. We won't be preparing a sermon, putting your photo there, and then we type furiously type at you, against you. No, none of us do that. You know, and a faithful teaching of the word of God will actually activate our conscience. And this preacher my, uh, that I get to know a little bit when he came to Singapore, he wisely said this about the word of God and the effects of the word of God. So I'm going to quote him. He said this. He said the word of God, when it's taught and proclaimed, will trouble the comfortable. People who are comfortable in their sin, who are comfortable with nothing to do with the Lordship of Christ, who are comfortable in, in living an immoral life, they say the word of God will actually trouble them. But at the same time, interestingly, the word of God will also comfort those who are already troubled. They are already troubled in their sin and know that they have sinned against God. Then they find grace in the word of God. It will comfort those who are troubled or troubled because of their suffering. You know, in the past seven, six, seven, seven, eight months of us preaching through the book of Job, we have heard people who are being who are warned, they are being troubled of using foolish counseling to people. You know, they troubled them. Because I've been counseling in this way. Well, it may be, may not be correct. It troubled them. But we also hear of people who say that through the preaching of Job in the past seven months they were also comforted in their trouble. You know, so you see, the word of God is just fantastic. You're able to do both. You know, so, and the third effect, it says there's not just a pure heart, a good conscience, but also a sincere faith, a genuine saving faith in Jesus Christ. You know, and a person can only be saved and come to a genuine faith in Jesus when they hear the preaching and the teaching of God's word. This can only happen no other way. There are people who can hear many types of fake gospel and they so-called believe or converted or even baptized, but their faith may not be even be genuine in the first place. Remember John chapter 2, verse 42, 43, when many people saw the signs of Jesus and they believed him, believed in his name. But, verse 23 says, Jesus didn't believe them. He didn't even entrust, entrust himself to them because he knows what is in the hearts of men. You know, but only a genuine preaching and teaching of God's word can someone come to a true faith in Jesus, a genuine faith in Jesus. Because faith comes from the hearing of God's word, of word of Christ. Right. So in summary, I just wrote a picture for you. False teaching may appear to be more exciting, more appealing, fashionable, modern, and but you look at it, it brings a lot of confusions, arguments, controversies, quarrels. But real teaching, correct teaching, and preaching of the word of God have these three effects. Love for other people, especially God's people, conscience, good conscience in himself, then a true faith in God. Can you see the effect of others, yourself, and God? This is the effect of actual proper teaching of the Word of God. So how do we identify these false teachers? These are the last two verses of the, of the passage. It says this, the opponents that they are facing, these certain men. Okay? And <clears throat> it's very hard to identify them. They are nice people in the Ephesus church, I believe. You know, they have, could even be very understanding people, inclusive people. You know, they are. You know, and they appear to be very kind to people. They may even flatter you, sing praises about you or the Ephesus, Ephesus people until some of the people are no longer standing on the ground. They are probably flying up in, in, in the sky. 
you know, they reflected them so well. And I've met some of them before, you know. And Paul, God's word says this, you don't look at them. You listen to the content. Okay, you listen to the content. Verse 6, verse 7, he says, says, these people were swerving from Paul's instruction. Swerving really means this. They, they are like straying from uh, correct teaching. They just stray by one, two degree a bit. Sounds like the real one, but they just sway a little bit. But second, this is the first red flag. Second red flag, Paul says, they in fact turn. Can you see? It's a total turn to something new altogether. Can you see? Verse 76 says that they, they actually wander away, they turn away to all this vain discussion. First is the soaring. The part is already a first warning sign. Second, they totally turn away. Can you see? So you look and listen to the content and don't look at their mannerism. They can be very nice. They can be very eloquent people. People today love eloquent people, whether it's in religious form or in the politics, but they just love eloquent people. Or they look at their charisma, the very attractive, magnetic personality. Or their enthusiasm. Verse 7 says these people, these people volunteer, desiring to be teachers. They are very enthusiastic. You will ask them, say, okay, uh, who wants to be a teacher? These false teachers will be like me. But you ask the EDC, who want to be who want to preach? The EDC like ah. Uh, here, uh, Jay, I think uh, they want uh, the EDC want to preach. <laughs> because you know the, the immense responsibility of handling God's word. But these people will volunteer. They love to be teachers. Why? Because it's popular. Why? They love limelight. Lime light. They love to be recognized. They want to be famous. But they cannot handle the word of God. Verse 7 says that they cannot handle the word of God. They are not faithful to handle the word of God. And they are talking rubbish. Things that they don't even understand. So don't just be humored by them. Don't just listen to their flatteries. So, coming to the end, what, how should we respond to this? Uh, my... Okay, sorry, I do meaning that. So straying away really means to add on or to subtract from what Paul is saying. Turning away really means to jump out, to totally change. Okay, so how should we respond to this? I have a few applications too, you know. Okay, so check our attitude towards God's word ourselves. You know, make sure that we are not here wanting to be entertained. Hey, today's speaker not very funny. Huh? Yeah, no, no, no jokes. Yeah. Quite lame and his joke. I have to tickle myself to laugh. No, no, don't come here to, to be entertained. You know, and don't be lazy when you come to the word of God. You know, and don't take it for granted. Yeah, yeah every day, the Sunday, the pastor will just preach on, let's preach on, very tired. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Why don't we just sing some song and that's all? Yeah. No, don't, 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 be, don't take it for granted. Okay? But take, come to the word of God with seriousness and with a, hum, with a humble obedience. How does it look like to be serious about the Word of God? I'm just going to suggest to you, well, prepare before. Before you meet someone for Bible study, before you, you, you come for Sundays, or before you go for IDG or anything, before you meet the Word of God, meet Christ in His Word, prepare, prepare beforehand. Make sure you read before, on, especially on Sunday, sleep early, don't play games until 4, 5 a.m. in the morning. Those of you who are Guilty, put up your hand. I'm ah, just kidding, no need to. But no, you know, no, no, don't, don't do that. Don't prepare yourself. Second, when you are here, stay engaged with the Word of God. Take notes if you must, which I know I'm very thankful some of you are taking pictures. I hope you're not taking pictures of me. I think you are taking pictures of this. <laughs> and some of you are typing furiously, you know, in, into your handphone, you know, which is good. Some of you are still writing and all this. Good, take notes of this because they will keep you focused. But make sure you are not distracted. You know, after that, suddenly your Lazada thing come out. Eh, hey, 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 sale. National Day sale. Eh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then oh, suddenly your TikTok come out. Then you, oh. oh. You not just distract yourself, you know. You distract the people all sitting behind you and you're like, hey, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know got 9% discount. Huh? You know, so don't, don't get distracted and don't distract other people. You know, and... After hearing the word of God, I put that you work out an SMRT application. 
Okay, what does it mean? That means straight away take the train home. No, that's, that's not what it means. SMRT stands for this. First, work out a specific area that you want to work on. You don't say, wow, today's sermon, great, great. Yeah, great, great. What's so great? Don't know. No, work out a specific area. You say, oh yeah, I want to obey God more. Where? Which area? You know, maybe the way we deal with our time, where we, if, if, if in, in today's context, is how we're going to make sure that my Bible intake is for real. It, it's going to be serious. Maybe this is a specific area. You know, we have more areas to talk about because First Timothy has a lot of, you know. Second, make sure it's measurable. So I'm going to take God's word seriously. This is a specific area. But how? You must have a measurable uh, uh, action. Maybe I'm going to ask someone, I'm going to ask um, uh, Elder Gregory, meet me every night for a one-to-one -one Bible reading. Oh, Elder Gregory was yawning. Okay, he's not very interested in you. Let's just him. Yeah, maybe do something measurable. Measurable, want to meet someone up maybe once a month at least. Can you help ask the person to mentor you, to teach you how to read the Bible on your own? You know. Third, you must totally, totally, totally rely on God. Pray that the Holy Spirit will help you, empower you to put that into action. You must rely on Him. Lastly, work out a timeline. You say, I'm going to meet someone 10 years later. I'm still going to meet someone. I'm really going to meet someone 10 years later. You are still, nothing happened. So I suggest within 48 hours, work out an application. Then pick up the phone if you need to call someone for help or work out some plan for yourself. On your knees, pray, work out that plan within the 48 hours. First application, check our attitude towards God's word. Second, well, there are tons and tons of false teaching out there. If you want to learn them, or you probably need eternity. So learn it when you are in eternity. So for now, how to deal with, how to face this false teaching is to equip yourself with the word of God and anything that deviates from the word of God, what you understand will be a false teaching. You don't have to know them. You just know your own stuff. What is the actual teaching? You know, so, so what you can do is to join the IDG group, join uh, um, to read with other people. That's what we do in IDG. You read, read the scripture and try to read it in context and understand more things. You know, or you can join external groups like power churches, power church organizations like BSF. All these are all good stuff where they teach you uh, how to read the scripture. You know, yeah. <coughs> and seek to apply and not for mere knowledge which is dangerous okay for what so that when you read the word of god these three things will happen love a pure heart for other people a good conscience within yourself and a greater faith to god let me do a summary of what is happening in these first seven verses paul left timothy in ephesus to stop false teachers and their false teachings so as to curb the effect, the ill effect on the churches. So no false teaching, whether it's deviating one degree or 20 degree, or it's a total flip of a wrong teaching, none of them are neutral. They always, always have an ill effect on the church. Even a degree different, you will have, you will have its ill effect on the church and on your life. It will have. Reflection time. Do you really believe that God's word is able to teach us? Really the word of God teach us to love genuinely, to teach us to live a godly life and able to generate a true faith in Jesus. Do you really believe that? Or are you challenging the authority of the word of God? Think about it. I'm going to pray. And yeah.
we will pray as we prepare our hearts for the partaking of um, Holy Communion together. Can we have our sister Esther to come and translate for us? Allow me to pray first. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that your word will sink into my heart and all of us as a church or so as deep convictions and we truly believe what you say and obey what you say by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, we want to welcome 